بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله سبحانه وتعالى فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له نشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان سيدنا ونبينا وحبيبنا وشفيعنا وكريمنا وسندنا واولانا ومولانا وقاعدنا وقره عيننا محمد عبده ورسوله صلوات الله وسلامه عليه وعلى اله واصحابه وازواجه واهل بيته وعلى من اتبعهم باحسان الى يوم الدين اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يريدون ليطفئوا نور الله بافواههم والله متم نوره ولو كره الكافرون هو الذي ارسل رسوله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله ولو كره المشركون وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم بدا الاسلام غريبا وسيعود كما بدا غريبا فطوبى للغرباء وقال عليه الصلاه والسلام اذا تبايعتم بالعين واخذتم اذناب البقر ورضيتم بالزرع وتركتم الجهاد صلت الله عليكم ظلا لا ينزعوه حتى ترجوا الى دينكم الى جهد دينكم صدق الله مولانا العظيم وصدق رسوله النبي الحبيب الكريم ونحن على ما قال خالقنا ورازقنا لمن الشاهدين والشاكرين والحمد لله رب العالمين dear respected elders brothers and friends in the hadith it is said that if there's a gathering like this taking place and somebody comes into the gathering and two people move aside and give a space to that person who's arrived jannat becomes wajib for those two people we give a place to somebody allah ta'ala gives a place in jannat so rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam taught us how to sit in the gathering so all the brothers requested if there's space in front of us fill the spaces and when people come join us afterwards then we should move them forward as well on one occasion rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was delivering a speech and was delivering the speech he noticed three people came the rest of the people were attentive listening to him they may not have noticed but rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam saw these three people have come and they came individually now what happened was when rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was delivering the speech the whole of the masjid was full there was hardly any space to sit down one person came but he had a zeal inside him he had a talab he had a motivation so he came and he was very eager to listen to the talk so he didn't just turn away he didn't think the place is full does i've got good enough excuse i can say i can't find any space but he instead because of his motivation he looked for space and then he moved forward and he came and sat down second person came after a while and he saw that there's hardly any space and he did not have as much zeal as the first person so he didn't look for the space he just sat on the edge near the door or outside the masjid the third person came after a while and he looked at the gathering he said there's no space here he had less zeal so he turned away he went back home so during the course of the speech rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentioned these three people not by name but he just said three people came the first person he saw he sought refuge with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him refuge meaning the person who came forward allah ta'ala has given him refuge he said the second person he shied away from allah ta'ala's mercy so allah ta'ala's mercy also shied away from him and the third person about the third person who looked said there's no space they make an effort in turn away went away he said the third person he turned his back to allah's mercy allah ta'ala's back allah ta'ala's mercy also showed his back to him and turned away from him so this is why brothers is very important in these gatherings whenever the gatherings are taking place whether it's ta'lim whether it's a speech whether it's a bayan we should sit attentively we should sit uh, close together and when the other brothers come we should join them in the talk as well because we are all in need of what is being said none of us can claim that alhamdulillah i have 100% full deen in my life i don't need deen i don't need islam i don't need any more hidayat we are all in need of hidayat we are all in need of guidance from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala once a person is given guidance then everything becomes easy for him this world and the hereafter becomes easy for him if a person is lacking in hidayat then the the easiest of amals become difficult for him I always give the example that you know we travel I'm from Bolton you can probably tell from my weird accent sorry about that you know when we travel from Bolton down to Bristol down to Cardiff down to London 3 4 hour journey so many times it happens that people are sitting there in the cars not even driving just sitting there 
for four hours doing nothing. Uh, they've got nothing to do as well. And yet they won't get the tawfiq to say one subhanallah even. When you go to other countries like when you go India, Pakistan, etc. You know the train journeys are 24 hours, 48 hours long, 53 hours long. People are sitting in the train doing nothing. Got no job to do. And yet they won't get the tawfiq to say one subhanallah even. And there have been times in our lives as well, brothers. Let's not kid ourselves. When months may have passed by, passed by and we didn't say the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We didn't offer salat. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives hidayat. He is a hadi. He gives guidance. And alhamdulillah, to some extent, we have guidance. Which is why on a Saturday afternoon, we are sitting in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as guests of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the shade of Allah ta'ala's mercy, and listening to the talk of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is tawfiq. And if it was not for the tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we couldn't do the easiest of actions. The story is narrated, the ulama kiram, they always give a beautiful example. And it's a true story apparently as well. They say once uh, uh, Nawab sahab, a rich man, he went shopping with his uh, slave, or with his servant. They did the shopping and they were coming back. In the subcontinent, hot country, it's Zohar time. The sun is at its peak and it's very hot. They're passing by the masjid and the Zohar Azan is called. So both of them are Muslims, but one has more hidayat, more tawfiq, more ability, more guidance than the other. The slave the, or the servant, he performs his salat. The Nawab sub, the rich man, he feels he does not need to perform salat. So he is not in the habit of performing his salat and his namaz. So when the azan is called, the, uh, the knocker, the slave, or the servant, he says to his master, he says, if you permit me, I'd like to go and perform my zahar salat. So the nawab sahib, he said, okay, leave your stuff here and go. But you better head back quickly, because we've got to get home. So he said, okay. So he went. I always say when this, I heard this story from the elders, but uh, I always say when I narrate this story, I always say that look, when we practice upon deen, Allah gives us the best of both worlds. And if a person does not practice upon deen, does not follow the commandments of Allah, he tires himself in this world and also in the hereafter. So this slave or the servant, he's going for salat, he will stand, uh, he will drink cold water, he will perform wudu with cold water, he'll stand under the fan, and he's getting the best of both worlds. He's in the shade. Uh, in, uh, uh, and he's in a nice cool environment so he's getting the benefit of this world and also because of his salat he'll get Jannah in Akhirah and the Nawab sahab who's outside standing in the sun sweating and no fun, no cold water he's losing out in this world and the hereafter so after a while the Nawab sahab now he's looking at his watch thinking when's this guy going to come out he waits and he waits and Zahara Azan is called, then Zahara Salat is done, then people start filing out of the masjid. <coughs> and the Nawab Sahib is waiting for his servant. Everyone files out of the masjid, but there's no sign of the servant. So now he's getting a bit impatient, and he goes onto the steps of the masjid, climbs the steps of the masjid, and looks inside from the door. Even now he does not get the tawfiq to go into the masjid. And he sees that the servant is in the first saf, and he's performing nafil, optional prayers. But this guy gets angry now. He said, I told him to hurry up but he's not coming. So he, say, he shouts from the door of the mosque. He said, Jaldi aja. He said, come quickly. So, so the servant, he finishes his salat, nice and calm, and he starts two more. So now this guy starts rolling his sleeves over. He gets even angrier. He said, aja, aja, jaldi aja. So now when the slave, he finishes, he gets a bit angry as well. He shouts back, he says, Jane nahi deta. He won't let me come out. He won't let me come out. So the um, guy, he's got high blood pressure now. He's seeing uh, red mist falls over him. He said, my slave, my servant, and somebody is stopping you. Who is stopping you? He goes, jane nahi deta. Who won't let you come out? So the servant, he gave a beautiful reply. He said, jo aapko andar aane nahi deta, wo mujhe bahir jane nahi deta. He who will not let you come into the masjid won't let me come out. That Allah who has not given you the tawfiq to come into the masjid even has given me so much tawfiq that I am just so engaged in my salat and so loving it that I can't come out of the masjid 
I perform two and I think to myself, let me do another two. Let me do another two. Because the tawfiq and the hidayat was there. Now we got to ask ourselves, brothers, have we got hidayat? Have we got tawfiq? Have we got guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on that level? Like the Sahaba Kiram, they had hidayat. 100% kamil, complete hidayat. What kind of hidayat did they have? Allahu Akbar. They were men. You know, like us, human beings. They had blood. They had a pulse. They had desires. Allahu Akbar. What kind of hidayat did they have? Abu Rehana radiallahu ta'ala, who came, he comes back from a journey. From a long journey. Now, those of us who go out for 40 days, 4 months, those, especially those brothers who go for 4 months every year, we know that when we come back after 40 days, especially after 4 months, it's like a honeymoon again. You know? It's like a second honeymoon. Some guys probably don't know what I'm talking about. Brothers who go for 4 months, 40 days will know. And those of us who don't know what I'm talking about, let's make intention after, in this ishtima that we'll go out in the path of Allah so we find out what this guy is talking about. Because, you know, absence makes their heart grow fonder. So this, you know, a person goes away from his wife for four months. When he comes back, it's like suhaq kirat all over again. It's like, you'll know what I'm talking about afterwards. So, um, he, he's gone for a long journey, Abu Rehana radiallahu ta'ala. And I don't know how long he went for. The Sahaba Kiram were not like us. You know, like 10 days, 40 days, and all that, you know, like little, like little kids, 10 days, 40 days. Sahaba Kiram used to stand up and give their lives. We give 40 days and we think, wow, look at me, I've done so well. And mashallah is good, but nothing compared to the Sahaba Kiram. And those after them, Allahu Akbar. I've just remembered another story. Farooq Rahmatullahi was a Tabi'i. In the time of the Sahaba Kiram, the way they lived their lives, was different to the way we live our lives. Their goals, their targets were different to ours. Their priorities were different. You ask me what's my priority? My car, my house, my job, my family, my kids. These are my priorities. Sahaba Kiram, what's your priority? The deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What's your goal in life? <laughs> to strive for the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What's your ultimate aim? To die for the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What would please you more than anything? That deen spreads throughout the whole world. This, these are the aspirations of Sahaba Kiram. And ours is something else. So, when they used to go, when the Sahaba Kiram and the people after them, when they used to go to the masjid to perform salat, they were not like us. You know, on Saturday, we have, it's a takeaway day. Yeah, in most families. So, sometimes, when uh, you've had too many takeaways and you're not, and it's hurting your pocket a bit, and the wife says, "Oh, let's, I'm not cooking today. It's takeaway." Then you say, "No, no, I love your fish and chips. Your fish and chips are the best. Do fish and chips today." So she's okay then. So now, what happens is on a Saturday, the brother's going for salat, and his wife says, "When will you be back? Uh, then I can fry the chips for you." And I think. So the, what does the brother say? Or what do I say? Allah forgive me. She said, when you come back, I'll start. She said, no, no, start flying now. I'll be back in a minute. <laughs> yeah. So I'll go and play my asal salat quickly. By the time I'm back, takeaway is ready. And that's how it is with us. We're with the masjid, in and out, in and out, lastminute.com. Yeah. Last one in, first one out. Pray sunnahs on the way back home. <laughs> Allah forgive us. Isn't it? And Sahaba Kiram, Allah Akbar, look at the difference between us and them. In the time of Sahaba Kiram, if somebody went to their house, knocked on their door, Assalamu Alaikum Alaikum Salaam, I'd like to uh, meet the person, is your husband in? She said, no, he's not. Where's he gone? He's gone for Salat, to the masjid for namaz. When will he be back? I have no idea. Might be tonight, might be a few hours, might be a few days, might be years. He might never come back, I don't know. And if on the other hand somebody went and knocked on their door and said, Is he in? He's not in. Where's he gone? He's gone to the market. When will he be back? Just wait a few minutes, he'll be back. Because the Sahaba Kiram used to go to the market or to their workplaces for their necessity. I've got to buy this, or I've got to earn this, I've got to sell this. And the wives knew that he'll be back within a few minutes. Us on the other hand, somebody comes knocking on our door and says, Where's he gone? He's gone to work. When will he really be back? There's no saying. Yesterday was 6 o'clock, day before was 8 o'clock. Sometimes he closes his shop really late. 
Sometimes he does overtime, there's no saying. Somebody comes and knocks on our door on Saturday morning, he's gone town, when will he be back? Oh, I don't know, window shopping innit? There's no saying when he's going to be back. And if somebody comes and knocks on our door and says, When's he, where's he gone? He's gone for Salat, when will he be back? I swear he'll be back in a minute, I know. That's the difference between us and the Sahaba Kiram and the people after them. Because they were attached to the masjid. Because they knew that the masjid is the house of Allah and the hidayat comes down here and it gets distributed from here to all the locality. And a person who spends most time in the masjid and connected to the masjid and engages himself in the amal and the actions of the masjid, he will gain hidayat the most. And then he will go and distribute it to his family. Which is what the Sahaba Kiram used to do. They used to, the men used to learn in the masjid and they used to gain the hidayat and then they used to go and teach to their wives and the wives would teach to the kids. This was their madrasa. So, Farooq rahmatullahi was a tabi, not a sahabi. But sh- soon after the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he went to the masjid. He was living in Medina. He went to the masjid and in those days when they used to go to the masjid, in our masjids nowadays they say, what is a taqaza? So Imam Sahib will stand up and say, we've got to do a mosque extension, can somebody give a bit of money? Yeah. Or we need to clean the masjid, can somebody give a bit of time? These are the taqazas of our masjid nowadays. But because we're only working on a small level. In the time of the Sahaba Kiram, they were working on a global level. Working for the whole of humanity. For the hidayat of all of mankind. So when they would go along, they may go for salat. And then after Salat, there may be little Jamaats made and they may say that who's ready to go out in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Whoever's ready, go on one side. So they would go and they would collect on one side. So Farooq Rahmatullahi went for Salat one day to perform his Salat and <laughs> I always say about the mobile phones. That better not be my fault. I always say about the mobile phones that we should turn them off in the masjid, in the bayan. So what people do instead of put, Imam Sahib always says, turn off your mobile phones. He doesn't say put them on silent. Don't put, he doesn't say put them on vibrate. He said turn them off. So people always put them, try to be one step ahead of Molly Sahib. Put it on silent, put it on vibrate. So I always say that you're better off in, your, in the bayan, when you sit in the bayan, you're better off leaving it on your tone as long as, as long as It's just a ringing tone, it's not music or anything. You're better off leaving it on like that than to put it on silent. People say, why? I say, because if I'm sitting in the gathering and my phone goes off, I know my tone. It'll go, I'll know. I'll get to be by itself to switch it off. If I've got it on vibrate, when it goes off, 10 people will reach there for their phones. Isn't it? And it'll cause major disruption. 10 people, everyone will reach for the phone. Is it my phone vibrating? And then they'll take it out. And they realize, oh, it wasn't mine. But they think, oh, I've got a message from before. Oh, I had to send that person a message. This and that, and then they distract. This is how shaitan gets into us. So Allah Ta'ala saves us, and Allah Ta'ala gives us the tawfiq to listen attentively. So Farooq Rahmatullahi, he went into the masjid, and he was, he stood up to God in the path of Allah, and he was sent out. Now, in the Sahaba Kiram's time, and the people thereafter, they had made the effort of deen the purpose of their life. And their women and their children and their families, everyone knew that this person, he is devoted only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there was no consultation about these things. You know, like nowadays, a son gets the shield, and this has happened a few days. A son gets the shield to go for four months. He's ready. He goes home. He's newly married. He goes home. He's got a young child as well. He goes home, tells his mother. Tells his wife first that I'm going for four months. So she and all that sort of stuff. The tears start. Then he thinks he gives a targhib and he you know he encourages her, inshallah Allah Ta'ala will reward us with Jannah, Allah Ta'ala will unite us in Jannah. We are copying the Sahaba Kiram, we will be resurrected with them. So eventually the young oh, bride, young, young woman, she comes around. Then he goes to the, his mother. Mother, I'm going for four months. So she turns her face away like that. And she says, Don't ever talk to me again. You have, you know, you've killed us, you've killed, you're going to starve your family, your wife, your kids, you know, what's going to happen to us? Now the son, he said, no mother, mother, I'm going out in the path of Allah, Allah will take care of you. Don't worry mother, and she said, no, if you're going to go, don't ever talk to me again. And these things happen. Anyway, so the brother, he says, okay, I'm not going. 
I can't go. He comes back to the masjid, tells him, Isha, Isha, we've got problems at home. Okay. Two months later, the job that he had applied for in Dubai, the contract comes through. Three years contract. He goes to his mother. He says, Mother, you know, today I got a letter in the post. There's a contract come through from Dubai for three years. But I'm going to say no to them. Why? Why? Mother, what about you? Oh, don't worry about me. Allah will take care of me. <laughs> Mother, it's in your old age. Who's going to take you to the appointments? You're old now. You need somebody. Oh, don't worry about me. Allah Hafiz. He goes to his wife. His wife says, oh, yeah, definitely go. What about you and the kids? Oh, don't worry. And don't come back within three years as well. You know, save more money. And inshallah, three years, Allah will take care of us. So, everything's changed for us. Allah forgive us. So, Farooq, he, when he was tashkid to go out in the path of Allah, in, the, in those times, they didn't come back and tell their wives. The wives knew that he has gone in the path of Allah. So, his wife, who was a young woman, who was pregnant at the time, she waits for him after Maghrib Salat. He goes for Asr Salat, he doesn't come back. She say, thinks maybe he'll come back after Maghrib, after Isha Salat. Because Sahaba Kiram and the people after them used to spend good time in the masjid. So, he, did, he doesn't come back. By Isha time. So she thinks that maybe he's so engaged in the masjid, maybe so many jamaats have come and he's serving them, that perhaps he will come back tomorrow. So she waits, next day he doesn't come back. So now this woman, she made it her habit that every day she would cook food for herself and her husband before Asr Salat. And then she would perform her Asr Salat and then she would sit, come and sit outside on the porch of her house because where her house was situated she could see the horizon and anyone that was coming into Medina she could see them coming from a distance so she would sit there with her tasbih in her hand after having performed her salat and she would sit there and remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and look on the horizon waiting for her husband to arrive so second day she did this the husband did not arrive Maghrib time when the sun started setting she went back into the house and then she made this the habit, her habit. Every single day she'd cook food before Asr and then she would, for herself and her husband, and she would go and sit and watch the horizon from Asr till Maghrib. And every single day she would find that her husband would not return. Days turned into weeks, weeks turned into months. And by Maghrib time, each day with a heavy heart and her head bowed, she would go back into the house, distressed that my husband's not coming back today. Maybe tomorrow, inshallah. She doesn't know where her husband's gone. She doesn't know when he's coming back. She doesn't know if he's coming back. Days turn into weeks, works, weeks into months. Months turn into years. And every single day she's sitting on the porch, looking at the horizon with a broken heart. After uh, sunset, she goes into the house and she sh sheds tears. And the years are passing and her black hair starts turning white. And her firm, tall complexion, fair complexion starts turning dark, starts wrinkling and her body, stops, body starts stooping over and she turns into an old woman. 27 years pass for 27 years. And her husband does not return. Now she doesn't even know if my husband's alive or whether he's been martyred in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But she's made this her habit. She says to herself that I will wait for him. Either he'll come back or I will die waiting for him. And every day she is shedding tears. And she has no more tears to shed. And her heart cannot be broken anymore. But she still has hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so one day she cooks her food according to her habit of 27 years. She sits there. Now her eyesight is failing her as well. And she looks on the horizon and nothing happens like the disappointments of the past 27 years her heart is broken again and she goes back into the house with a heavy heart she performs a maghrib salat and then she hears voices outside her house she goes and looks and her, when, she, when her husband had left she was pregnant and after he left she had the child and he was a boy and she nurtured the child she educated him, she brought him up now he was a young man of 27 years so she saw that her son is talking to someone. In fact, they're arguing. So she went outside and she listened. And the son is arguing with this old man. And he's saying that, how dare you try to enter the house of a Muslim in Medina without permission. Don't you know, now Maharam, you know, women are in this house. And you trying to enter it, how dare you? So the old man, who's got white hair, who's stooped over, he said, no, no, son, this is my house. 
and the son's getting angry. He said, no, what are you talking about? This is my house. How dare you say that? And he's grabbed him like that. He said, how dare you try to enter my house? And he's about to hit him. Because the old man is insisting, no, 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 this is my house. So the old woman goes and she looks carefully. And she grabs her, her son's hand. And she says, son, don't, please don't hit him. Because you're right in what you say. This is your house. But he's right in what he says as well. This is his house as well. Because this is your father who you've never met. He's returned from the path of Allah after 27 years. 27 years. Her whole life. His whole life. Sacrifice for the path of Allah. For the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imagine what her Eids must have been like. Herself and her small child. She can't afford new clothing for herself or her child. Does she not want to be with her husband? Spend the days and nights with her husband. Go shopping with her husband. Allah Akbar. All her aspirations, all her desires, she just sacrificed. And he sacrificed for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then how did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward them? Allah Akbar. They go into the house and they rejoice. And they celebrating his return. And then all night they stay awake talking. And he's giving the garugzari of 27 years. I went here, I went there, I did this, I did that. And they're crying. And then uh, Fajr Salat, the son Rabia ibn Farooq, he goes for Salat. And Farooq leaves a bit later because Farooq, when he had left 27 years ago, Masjid Nabuwi was very small and the population of Medina was quite small. So he didn't realize, when he gets to the Masjid, he realizes that the population of Medina has grown so much and the Masjid has been expanded. So he gets there. And Fajr Azan is about, Fajr Namaz Salat is about to start. He doesn't get any room inside the masjid. He's right at the back. Farooq Rehmatullah. And he sees Allah Akbar. So many people. And the Imam Sahib starts Salat. And he's praying behind him. And the Imam Sahib reads, recites beautifully. And he's reminded of the time of Sahaba Kiram Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi And he's crying. What beautiful recitation. I'm back in Medina. Allah brought me back to Medina. And he's crying. After Salat, he notices that not a single person gets up to go. Everyone remains seated. Because dear respected brothers and elders, there was a time in the Ummah when the Ta'aleem, you know nowadays Ta'aleem takes place in our masjid, same all three, four people sit. There was a time in the Ummah when the effort was taking place. In the Ta'aleem Halqa, in the Hadith Dars, hundreds of thousands of people used to sit. And they could not even count how many people were sitting. They had to count the ink pots left by the people. And they are not amounted to so many thousands. Seven different people were appointed in uh, Abdullah ibn Mubarak's gathering to relay the voice to other people. So Abdullah ibn Mubarak would speak and the second person would shout his words and the, second per- the next person would hear it and he'd shout it on so that because they didn't have loudspeakers to accommodate for the whole of the gathering. That was what the Talim Halqa was like. And through this effort, we've got to try and revive that again in our homes, in our masajid. So, he noticed not a single person stands up. So, and then the hadith dar starts. Somebody starts doing ta'aleem and saying the narrations of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So, Farooq Ramtai is reminded of the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and sahaba kiram. He starts and he says to the person next to him, he says, who is this Maulana sahab? He's doing such a fine bayan. Who is it? He said, oh, don't you know him? He said, no. He says, it is uh, Rabi'ah, the Ustad of Imam Malik, Ustad of Sufyan Suri. He is a muhaddith of Medina. Don't you know him? He said, no. He's Rabi'ah ibn Farooq. You know that guy who went in the path of Allah 27 years ago, never returned. This is his son. So Farooq Ramtia started crying. He said, yes, yes, I am Farooq and this is my son. He went out in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah ta'ala looked after his son, made him the Ustad of Medina, the Muhaddith of Medina. So this was the effort that was taking place in the time of Sahaba Kiram and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the people after them. And we have to try and revive that effort that we recognize our Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We fall in love with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we go to every single person and we, in front of them, we introduce Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that they fall in love with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they recognize the grandeur and the greatness and the qudrat and the power and the majesty and the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the purpose of this effort. 
that we become Allah wale, we become people of Allah and the whole of mankind become people of Allah so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala becomes pleased with all of mankind and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala solves all of humanity's problems and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends down his mercy all the problems that exist in the world today whether on an individual basis whether on a global basis global warming and this and that, everything it is all in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all the problems come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah alone will solve all these problems when? when humanity will come onto Iman and Amal when we will obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and follow the blessed ways of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Allah ta'ala will become pleased with us and Allah ta'ala will send down His mercy and Allah ta'ala will send down rain at the right time in the correct proportion today what happens? when people want rain, rain doesn't come so there's drought and when people want rain, rain comes but they Allah Ta'ala sends more than they want so there's floods in the time of Sahaba Kiram Allah Ta'ala sent down everything according to how they wanted it and we have to make that effort so Allah becomes our friend so that we can solve our own problems and we can solve humanity's problems Allah Ta'ala has sent us into this world so that we can make the world a better place one person was going out in the path of Allah immigration stopped him at the airport they said where are you going? he said I'm going to make the world a better place he was going for four months to America he said I'm going to make the world a better place Allah Ta'ala put it into the heart of the immigration officer who was a non-Muslim he said you know you're right he said pray for me as well one person who was going, they said, where are you going? He said, I'm going to stop all the earthquakes and tornadoes and floods. They said, go, go. <laughs> because they realize it is in our hands. A moment when he becomes a person of action. Allahu Akbar. Because of him, Allah Ta'ala will send down the mercy. Allah Ta'ala, peace and prosperity will rule throughout the whole world because of the imams of a mu'min. Once a shepherd was grazing his flock and a wolf came and devoured one of his sheep so he started crying uncontrollably crying other shepherds said to me said, this is daily occurrence this happens all the time big deal you know he's only grabbed one of your sheep big deal he said no no he said that's not why I'm crying I'm not crying at the loss of one of my sheep he said I'm crying because it seems that Umar ibn Abdul Aziz has died the people said what are you talking about he said, yes, our leader, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, it seems that he has become Rahmatullahi, he has died. He said, crazy, what are you talking about? How? There were no mobile phones at that time, and he was in the capital, and this villager, in the village. He said, how do you know? He said, I know. He said, no. So they noted down the time that the attack had happened on the sheep. And this guy had said that it seems that Umar ibn Abdul Aziz has died. A few days later, news reached them that Umar ibn Abdul Aziz has died. So they asked, when did he die? So they said, four days ago at this time. So they realized that at that exact time that the wolf had devoured the sheep was the time that Umar ibn Abdul Aziz died. Upon his death, Allah Ta'ala lifted the peace and the prosperity. Because of his justice, Allah Ta'ala had kept so much peace and harmony, not only amongst human beings, but he said that the wolves used to play with the sheep. But he died, then Allah Ta'ala took that away. So it is dependent upon our actions, brothers. If I become a better person, the world will become a better person. Never mind me whinging and complaining, like uh, Hazrat Hafsa was saying yesterday, our, our enemies are not the non-Muslims, uh, you know, uh, not America and this and that, they are not our enemies. Uh, we are our wor own worst enemies. Shaitana is our enemy, and the Hadith says your biggest enemy is who? Your biggest enemy is the nafs which is inside you. Your own desires, your caprice. You are your own worst enemy. Because America or whatever is not stopping you from performing Fajr Salat. The government is not stopping you from performing Fajr Salat. It is yourself, your own nafs that is stopping you from doing good actions. And so you have to be overcome your own caprice and your own desires. We have to overcome our own desires so that we can walk towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we can become obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that Allah ta'ala, when we perform these good actions and we move towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah ta'ala will become our friend. And what happens when Allah ta'ala becomes somebody's friend? I can give you examples of Sahaba Kiram as well. There are so many examples of Sahaba Kiram. I'll give you examples of Sahaba Kiram afterwards. I've just remembered one story. One person, he was not a Sahabi. 
He was Allah wale, meaning a person of Allah. May Allah make us all men of Allah. We can all do this. The reason why I'm giving you an example of a non-Sahabi is so that we can be encouraged that inshallah I can do this as well. <coughs> Anybody who strives in the path of Allah and strives to gain nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and follows the blessed ways of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and abstains from disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, devotes himself and devotes his life to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he'll become the friend of Allah. Then Allah's help will be with him. Like this person, he was a man of Allah, he's walking along. And from the opposite direction, now he is engaged in the zikr of Allah. Lost in the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. See, like the Sahaba Kiram, they were so absorbed in the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, like us guys, we are so much absorbed in our dunya, in our car and stuff like that. Sometimes we'll just be sitting there and we'll be, and somebody say, oh you're daydreaming. Oh, sorry. And then if they ask us, or if we ask ourselves, what were we daydreaming about? It'll be business, car, money, wife, something like that. The Sahaba Kiram, they used to daydream, they used to get absorbed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They used to do so much zikr, they used to do so much remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that when they used to go to the toilet, when they used to go to answer the call of nature, they had to stop themselves doing zikr. Involuntarily, their lips were always moving in the zikr of Allah. So they had to put pebbles into their mouths to stop themselves, because they knew that I cannot do zikr when I go to the toilet. Involuntarily, they would do so much zikr. We don't even do zikr voluntarily, but even when they would sleep, the zikr would be coming out of their chest. Because they loved Allah. Everything about them was Allah, Allah, Allah. <coughs> and we have to try and gain that. So this person, he was absorbed in the love of Allah. He's walking along thinking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he's lost in thought. Now he didn't realize that there was a puddle. From the opposite direction, a young boy and girl, boyfriend, girlfriend were going on a date. The girl, the girl was all dolled up. And the boy was all gymmed up and they're walking along and you know the boy you know how it is he's always trying to impress the girl and all this sort of stuff so the girl the, the buzuk accidentally the old sage he steps into the puddle and the water splashes on his own clothes as well but also upon this girl's fine white dress so she gets angry and she she tuts and she stops and she looks at her boyfriend. She doesn't say anything, she just looks at him. Now we all know what she was trying to say. She's saying that this Buddha has messed my clothes up, what are you going to do about it? This is what that, that gaze meant. Yeah? So she just looked at him like that. So the boy, he didn't need a second bidding, he thought this is it, this is my chance to prove how strong I am. He's going to hit an old man, he's going to prove his strength. So he steps up and he slaps this old man. The buzruk. And the old man, he takes a slap and he falls down into the puddle. And all his clothes are wet and dirty and he's got a bruise on his face. And the boy is dead happy now, dead proud of himself. And the girl, she's dead happy as well. Arm in arm now, they start walking off. And they walk a few steps and the buzruk, when he gets hit, he doesn't complain, he doesn't cry or anything. He doesn't do anything. All he does is he just looks up. He doesn't say to him, why did you hit me? It was an accident, I splashed her by accident, sorry, anything like that. He just looks up like that. That's all he does. And he's still sitting in the puddle. So the boyfriend and girlfriend walk a few steps and then the boy, he slips and he falls and he drops dead. Hits his head on the curb or something like that, he's dead. So the girl starts screaming and the people come running and she says, this old man killed my boyfriend. She's screaming and crying. Now people, they look at the old man still sitting in the puddle, a few hundred yards down, this young guy is lying there. They can't make sense of it, so they call the police. So they call, the police come and they can't make sense of it. She is adamant that this old man has killed my... They say, no, no he couldn't have. Look, at, he's sitting over there, and he's an old, fe feeble old man. And this guy, he seems a pretty tough guy. How could he have killed him? So she said, no, I swear, she kill he killed him and all this. So they said, okay, the other witness is the old man, let's go and ask the old man. So they said to him, they went to him and they said, kya hua? What happened? He said, nothing, nothing. They said, no, something has evidently happened. You're sitting here with a bruise on your face and you're in the puddle and that guy is dead. Something has evidently happened. He said, no, 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 just ignore it. Nothing has happened. No, something has happened. What's happened? He said, just ignore it. It's nothing to do with you. It was just a friend, a fight between two friends. That's all it is. A fight between two friends. 
That's all it is. So they said, what do you mean? So he said that her friend hit me. So my friend hit her <laughs> friend. Her friend hit me. So my friend hit her friend. Hit him. Meaning, she, she just had to look at her boyfriend to say, what are you going to do about it? He had that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he just had to look at this guy and say, Ya Allah, what are you going to do about it? This guy has hit me without reason, unjustly hit me. What are you going to do? He just looked up like that and Allah ta'ala has helped him. This is a, not a sahabi. And the sahaba kiram's story is Allahu Akbar. Unbelievable. Today it seems like fairy tales to us because we've not made the effort. But the Sahaba Kiram had built up such a connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they could make the impossible possible. Their horses walked on water. You know the story. That's impossible. Even in 2011, with all the advancement of science, that has not become possible yet. Isn't it? And yet, the Sahaba Kiram did it. Walked on water. Even with the advancement of science, it's still been impossible to create food from nothing. And yet the Sahabi, we know the story, he went and he made dua, and Allah Ta'ala made the flour mill go round. Without anyone turning it, without a motor, and without any ingredients going in, and the flour is pouring out. He said, Ya Rasulullah, something amazing happened today. He said, what's that? He said, I made dua, and Allah Ta'ala made flour pour out of the flour mill. He said, then what happened? He said, I wanted to see where he was coming from, so I picked it up and it stopped. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, had you not opened it up, flour would have come out from there till the day of judgment. From the treasures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the Sahaba Kirama recognized that Allah is a provider. Allah is a raziq, He is a razaq. He is a doer of all things. He is a giver of life. He is a giver of death. He can do everything. Nothing is impossible for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And everything is nothing. Allah is everything. If we get Allah on our side, we have the hidden powers of the heavens and the earths with us. And we are not alone. Ibrahim alayhi salam was all on his own. And his own mother, his uncle, his father, the great king of that time, all the people are on the other side. And they said, we're going to burn you alive. Ibrahim alayhi salam said, my Allah is enough for me. It seemed on the face of it, Ibrahim alayhi salam is on his own. And all these people, they're in the majority. Ibrahim alayhi salam is definitely going to die. They went and dug a trench. And then they said to the people, Namrud who claimed to be God and people were worshipping him at the time. They said, he said to them, he said, go and get firewood. The more you bring, the more sawab you get. The more reward you'll get from me. So people went. Some old woman, her son was ill. She made dua to Namrud. She said, Oh Namrud, if my son gets better, I'm going to donate you know, one ton of firewood. Like that, mannat. And they made promises like that. So people went far and wide and they collected so much firewood that a trench had to be dug and it was put inside. Then they lit the fire. And the fire was so ferocious, so hot, that birds could not fly over it. Birds fly at such a high altitude and birds could not fly over it. Now logic says Ibrahim is on his own, all these people are going to fling him in, he's going to definitely die. But what the people failed to recognize is that Ibrahim was not alone. He had Allah with him. In other words, he had the hidden forces of the heavens and the earths with him. So we all know what happened, Ibrahim got thrown in and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the fire into a garden for him. And he lived there for 40 days and Allah ta'ala sent down a garment from Jannah for him. And it became an air-conditioned environment for him. Not too hot, not too cold. And the food came down from Jannah for him. And when he comes out, he says, those were the best days of my life, because he was in a garden of paradise. So Sahaba Kiram had that yaqeen that Allah is everything. If I have Allah, I have everything. If I don't have Allah, I have nothing. If I have all the riches of this world, but I don't have Allah in my life, in reality I've got nothing. I'm a pauper. And I need to watch my back all the time. Like a person who goes into town, when he parks on double yellow lines, or parks where he's not supposed to park, even when he goes into a shop, he's one eye there, you know. He's anxious all the time. He can never find any peace. Isn't it? Because he knows that any time I could get a ticket, he's always looking, running out. Or if he's not checking, he's still got that thing, apprehension that maybe I'll get a ticket. A person who does not have Allah in his life is like that. Their, a person who does not have Allah in his life, their whole life is like that. 
anytime anything could happen despite my wealth despite my intelligence despite my means anything could happen at any time but the person who has Allah in his life he is content that if something bad does happen it will come from Allah Allah will solve it anyway so we have to bring that yaqeen and that belief into our hearts that Allah is the doer of everything Allah can do Allah is almighty Allah is all powerful if I have Allah on my side on my side I have everything and if I do not have Allah I have nothing and that yaqeen comes into our hearts that Allah 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 and if I have yaqeen in my heart that Allah he is the creator of the heavens and the earth he did it without getting tired so will he not solve my small problem my child is ill that's nothing for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that financial problem that's nothing for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all the world's problems are nothing for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala why because Allah ta'ala is qadir he is all powerful all doing Allah Akbar look at the qudrat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on Monday morning on Monday morning one cow will be slaughtered in the slaughterhouse of Cardiff. Bear with me, brothers. On Monday morning, one animal will be slaughtered in the slaughterhouse of Cardiff. The butchers, the people of the slaughterhouse, they will strip it, skin it, they'll hang up the carcass. They'll take off its head and its tongue and its eyes and its entrails, intestines, and they'll throw it onto the skip. And the meat will be cut up and distributed into two, three shops. Five customers will go into each of the shops and buy some meat, buy that meat. That meat, by Monday afternoon, Monday evening, will have gone into uh, ten different houses. In each house, five individuals will eat the meat within a few days that cow the meat part of the cow will have gone into 50 different individuals follow me those individuals when they eat that meat Allah with his Qudrat will make the meat nourish their bodies so the meat will become blood cells blood cells will become uh, skin cells tendons, ligaments, muscles, bone cells it will become a part of their body part, part of that meat will just get digested and it will turn into feces then those 50 people will go to answer the call of nature they will go to the toilet and when the excrement comes out they will flush it and it will get washed down the sewers and it will end up in the river what's it called? Seven <laughs> it will the I don't know where we come from it all ends up on Blackpool Beach I don't know where <laughs> that's where the sewage goes yeah so it'll end up in the sea basically yeah you following me so now within a few days that cow has become a part of 50 different people's body and it has also ended up in the sea via the feces yeah let's go back to the no let's stay on these humans now these humans 50 different humans who've all got a part of that cow inside them these 50 different humans somebody will get a job in Dubai that guy that I was talking about earlier he'll, his mum will force him to go he'll get a job in Dubai, he'll live there, he'll die there, he'll get buried in Dubai one guy in America, one guy in Philippines one guy. so these 50 individuals will get buried in different places they'll die in different places when they get buried, when I die I'm not going to say anyone else because people might get offended when I die, when I go in my grave first of all the bugs will come and they'll eat my eyeballs yeah that's the first part of the body that gets eaten and it become hollow sockets then they'll eat the rest of me and it'll happen to all of us so don't it's gonna happen sorry brother the bugs will eat us then those bugs will go back into the earth those bugs will get eaten by other bugs yeah so now these 50 individuals who have distrib been distributed throughout the whole world when they eventually die they'll become a part of the earth and part of the soil and part of bugs and the bugs will be eaten by other bugs and then a hundred years later my body will be dug up and I'll have disintegrated yeah I'll have decomposed and then they'll bury someone else in my place and so I'll whatever's left of me will just fly away and become part of the dust and stuff follow me let's go back to the skip the entrails and all that that will be eaten by maggots yeah maggots turn into flies and fly away frogs will eat those flies snakes will eat those frogs that 
cow has gone into maggots, into flies, into frogs, into snakes, into whatnot. Yeah? Some of the bugs will eat the entrails and the eyes and stuff, then cats will eat, come and eat those bugs, and then that cat will go and get, die somewhere and buried somewhere, and these bugs will die somewhere. You know what I'm talking about, brothers. In other words, within a few months of that cow being slaughtered, that cow will have been distributed everywhere. Throughout the whole world, not only the world, but in the space, in the heavens, and the earth, and the wind, and the dust. Allahu Akbar. I've not even mentioned the skin. The, the skin will go to the tanners. It'll get exported to Pakistan. They'll clean it, then the tanner will sell it to the factories in Pakistan. A handbag factory guy will buy it, and he'll have a handbag made out of that cow skin. A shoe factory guy will buy some of the skin, shoes will be made, purses will be made. Those handbags will be exported back to England again. Somebody in Bradford will buy the handbag and use it. She'll use it for five years, then she'll say it's out of fashion, then she'll give it to charity. From the charity shop, it gets exported out back into Philippines or somewhere like that. Yeah? Those shoes that got made in Pakistan got exported out to China. Some guy in China wore them. Uh, some shoes got exported out into America. In other words, brothers, within a few months, that one cow that will be slaughtered on Monday will have been distributed throughout the whole world. Yeah? Allahu Akbar. And then there will come the day of judgment. Allah Ta'ala will say on the day of judgment, Oh, that cow that was slaughtered on the 11th of July, 2011 in the slaughterhouse of Cardiff Kunu come back to life and with one hukam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the bugs and the insects and the humans and the feces and the water and the winds and the earths and the whole world all the particles of that cow will come back together and that cow will get formed exactly as it was on the day that it got slaughtered the patterns and the patches will be exactly the same and Allah will do this through his Qudrat and brothers on Monday not one cow will be slaughtered in Cardiff hundreds of thousands will be slaughtered throughout the whole world and to this day since the beginning of time Allah will infinite numbers of cows and goats and different kinds of animals have been slaughtered a million, billions and trillions an infinite number of humans have died and become part of the earth and stuff on the day of judgment Allah Ta'ala will say that to each and every one of us and every single animal and everything will come back to life exactly as we are I will come back to life exactly as I was on the day that I died it will never happen that his eyes will come into me and my tongue will go into him exactly as I am Allah Ta'ala will bring me back to life with his kudrat and his power this is how great our Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. Bala qadirina ala nusawiya banana. Allah Akbar. Allah Ta'ala says, you know the people in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu the non-Muslims used to deny resurrection. How will Allah bring us back to life? How can that happen? They did not recognize the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they used to question, how can that happen? Allah will bring me back to life exactly as I am now? My arms, my feet, my head will be the same? How can that happen? So Allah Ta'ala called back to them and He said, Never mind bringing you back to life. I will resurrect you and reconstruct you down to your fingertips. Bala qadirin ala nusawiya banana. When the Sahaba Kiram heard the ayat, they said, Allah Akbar, and their iman shut up. The Allah Ta'ala will resurrect us exactly as we are, down to our fingertips. Allah Akbar. But in this day and age, we can understand this ayat better. This ayat takes on a different meaning. Because in the last hundred years, science has discovered that every single person has an individual and unique fingerprint. In fact, in the last 10, 20 odd years, they've discovered that not only do I have a matching print, fingerprint as anyone alive in this world at this time, but they've dug up dead bodies and they've realized that my fingerprint does not match anyone alive in the world today, nor does it match anyone that's lived in the past, nor will anyone coming after me up to the day judgment have the same exact fingerprint as mine. Allah Akbar. Every single fing person's fingerprint is individual. In fact, now they've discovered that every single person's tongue print is individual as well. Allah Akbar. Every person's tongue print is unique as well. 
Allah Ta'ala says, Bala qadirin ala nusawiyya banana. I will resurrect you down to your fingertips, i.e. your fingerprints. When you wake up on the day of judgment, your fingerprints will be exactly as it is now. This is the Qudrat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the Allah that we have not recognized. وَمَا قَدْرُ اللَّهَ حَقَّ قَدْرِ If we had recognized that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we would make that Allah and the deen of Allah and the ways of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa the purpose of our life. We would devote ourselves, ourselves fully, our living, our dying, our health, our wealth, our time, our abilities, our intelligence, everything would be devoted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But on the other hand, brothers, because we have not made Allah a part of our life, we give Allah and the Masjid and Deen a very short time. And for the dunya, which is perishable, which we're going to leave, when I drop dead, my car will still be parked there, my house will still be there, my bank balance will still be there, and I will be gone. This is why Rasulullah sallallahu says, Allah Akbar, and it's such simple logic, such simple logic for all, us, all to understand. But we don't understand. That place where we're going to live forever and ever and ever. How much effort should we be making effort? How much effort should we be making for that life? And the place where we're only going to live for 60, 70 years, how much effort should we be making? Common sense says we should be making more effort for the hereafter. But our actions show otherwise. My brother, he met his uh, a school friend of his in Jummah Salat one day. My brother is about 32 years old, younger brother. He met him. And he met this mate of his and he said to him, Salaam alaikum, it's been a long time, I'll see, how are you doing? Alhamdulillah. He said, what are you up to these days? So my brother said, I'm a teacher. He said, oh, what are you doing? He said, oh, I've got a few businesses. He said, well, uh, what do you specialize in? He goes, I've got post office. Post offices. He said, oh, mashallah, how many have you got? Now this guy is about 30, 32 years old. He said, I've got 27 post offices. 27 post offices. My brother was shocked. He said, Mashallah, so you've retired. Logic says, if a person's got 27 post offices, you should retire. He said, no, no, not yet. I've got a few targets, got a few targets. So I asked my brother afterwards, did you not ask him what his targets were? He said, no. I said, I'll tell you what his targets were. He's got 27, his target, in his mind he's thinking, I'll get 30, then I'll retire. But he won't. 30 will go to 40, 40 will 50. Because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لَوْ أَنَّ لِبْنِ آدَمَ وَادِيًا مِنْ ذَهَبٍ if a person, if the son of Adam, if any one of us had a jungle of gold or had a valley full of gold, we would not be content with that. In fact, we would desire a second one. And a second, third, third, fourth. This is Rasulullah Sassam saying this. And it's true as well. When we first, or our forefathers first came to this country, people used to say, Allah, ek ghar de de. Chota sa, koi baat de, ek mil jaye. Allah, give me a small house. Two bedrooms, all I'll be happy. Give me one shop, ya Allah. I'll, I won't ask for anything else. If that time, we're praying for that. Umrah, we're praying for that. Hajj, we're praying for that. Kaabatullah ka gilaf pakar ke. Ya Allah. And what happened? We got the one house. And we got the one small shop. Are we happy? We're striving for more and more and more. And then Allah Akbar, Rasulullah Sallallahu says, So if the dunya cannot fill the belly of a man, what will fill the belly of a man? He says in that same hadith, وَلَنْ يَمْلَعْفَاهُ إِلَّا التراب. Only the soil of the qabr, of our grave, will fill our bellies. When the bugs come and start eating my stomach and he opens up, and the soil will fall in to my stomach, my stomach will be full. Otherwise, in this dunya, our khayshat, our desires, can never be fulfilled. It is only Jannat where the ful- desires can be fulfilled. So I will drop dead, and everything will be left behind. So Rasulullah sallallahu says, Yaqul ibn Adam mali mali. The son of Adam, he says, this is mine. See this house? See this house is mine. See this car is mine. Bank balance is mine. When we have an extension done to our house, we are wasting, the ummah is wasting its wealth, our wealth. Allah Ta'ala has given us this money in this country. We are so, mashallah, wealthy, so well off. Allah Ta'ala has given us this so we can help the mankind. We can help people. Instead, we are spending it on ourselves, on extensions, and decorations, and vacations, and ostentation. Four things that ummah is wasting the wealth on. First, I've got a house. Let me decorate it. Decoration. Then I'm happy. Not happy with it. One year down the line, two years down the line, rip it off. New wallpaper. That goes on for a few years, wasted so many thousands of pounds in there. And now, I need it extended. So now extension, wasting money on that. Whatever is a necessity is exempted, but we go beyond that. And then, after that, I've got a nice house, extended, 
it's comfortable for me and my family but most of the things that people are doing nowadays are not for themselves it's for other people to show other people ostentation otherwise a Vauxhall Astra will serve my purpose why am I buying a whatever a Hot Wheels fat car why am I buying that not for myself it's, so that, uh, to, it's for other people really so other people think oh whoa, man respect you bro you got nice wheels <laughs> So I said, just give him the car keys, it's for him, you bought it, not for yourself. <laughs> so, ostentation. And then, vacations. Ummat is going on holidays now, with the family and stuff. And the Sahabi came to Rasulullah, so I'm not saying, it, don't, don't come back to me and say, oh, are you saying his vacations are haram? I'm not saying vacations are haram. But the Sahabi, let's look at the, our examples of the Sahaba Kiram. One Sahabi, he came, Allahu Akbar, may Allah Ta'ala reward the Sahaba Kiram. Any question that we want to ask, came up in the time of Sahaba Kiram as well. So people ask Molisa, Molisa, can we, is it not, is it not, uh, we are not allowed to go on holiday with the, thing, with the family. So let's look at Sahaba Kiram. One Sahabi came to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say, and he says, Ya Rasulullah, idhanli bisayaha, allow me to go for tourism, allow me to go on holiday. So what did Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam reply? The siyaha and the tourism of my ummah is striving out in the path of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. When you will strive out in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah ta'ala will show you the world, He will show you the people, and He will show you hidayat and deen as well. So I said that. So my wife, she says, that's for men, you men go in the jamaat. So I said, no, 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 you come with me as well. We have maskurat, we have ladies jamaats as well. We go, you get to see the world as well. So Allah ta'ala has made it so easy for us. So, Yaqul ibn Adam, the son of Adam, he says, this is my wealth, my wealth. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, no, yours is only that which you've eaten and used up or worn and used up. Whatever you spent basically is yours, you can say that's yours. And whatever you've spent in the path of Allah, given for charity, is yours because it's saved in Allah's bank. Anything besides that, anything that you've not spent on yourself and you've not given in charity, what's on your, in your bank balance, what you're saving or what you're showing people that this is mine, it's not yours. You're deluded if you're thinking it's yours, and if you're saying it's yours, it's not yours. Whose is it? It belongs to your heirs, it belongs to your family, it's your wife's. If your kid, it's your kids, it's not yours, because the moment you drop dead, all of it's going to them. So brothers, we've got to get out of this delusion, and we've got to set our lives right. And the examples for us are the Sahaba Kiram. They led such beautiful lives, they were like us. It was as if they didn't have wife and kids. We have one wife we can't handle. They had wives. We have three, four kids, five kids. I met a friend of mine. I said, how many kids you got? He said, seven. I said, oh Lord, well, seven kids. Uh, nothing. In our day and age, you say, seven kids. How do you manage? How does your wife manage? And Sahaba Kiram had, sometimes they had hundreds of kids. And they had desires as well. And they, and they had businesses. They had wealth. They were wealthier. Some of the Sahaba Kiram were miles wealthier than any of us. If I had time, I would tell you about Abdurrahman ibn Auf. His businesses, if you put all the businessmen of Cardiff together, their business cannot match the business of one person, Abdurrahman ibn Auf. You don't believe me? Read it in the books. Check how big his business was. And yet he made so much effort. Rasulullah in this world gave him glad tidings. Oh Abdurrahman, you are definitely going to paradise. So brothers, we have wasted our lives in that respect. We have made the world our purpose and this world has been so treacherous to us. I thought my wealth would help me out and my wealth let me down so many times. And on the ta at the time that I need my wealth the most, when I'm dying, my wealth will let me down the most. Oh wealth, save me, get me a medicine. The wealth will say, money can buy medicine but it cannot buy cure. Money can buy you a bed, but it cannot buy you sleep. Money can buy you acquaintances, but it can't buy you friends. So my wealth will let me down, the whole world will let me down. But Allah, if I make Allah my friend, Allah will never let me down. Allah will be with me, help me in this world and help me in the hereafter as well. So brothers, we got to make an effort to make Allah our friend. Connect ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Otherwise, this whole world is a deception. We're going to leave it behind. Nothing and no one is going to come with us. I alone are going to go in my qabr, in my grave. And I will have to give an account for my own life. And very quickly I will end. Very, very quickly I'll end with one example. When Jamaat came, 
from Pakistan and they give this example. They said that one brother, he made intention, the Jamaat talked to him and he made intention to go for four months. He got ready, then he went home to the home minister and the home minister, the wife, when she found out that he's going for four months, she said she started crying and what's going to happen to me and the kids and you killing us and this and that. So he went back to the masjid and he said to the Imam Sahib, to the Amir Sahib, he said, Amir Sahib, sorry, I can't go for four months. Amir Sahib and the Jamaat brothers, they were sudden, they said, you were so ready to go for four months. What's happened? He said, my wife, she just, she said, I can't cope without you, I'll die if you go and I think. So the Amir Sahib explained, he said, look, you love your wife and your children, mashallah, this is all good. But in reality, you're doing this for your akhirat. And your children and your wife and kids are not going to help you in your akhirat, in your hereafter. You have to do this. You have to sacrifice their love for them. No, no, Amir Sahib, they love me too much. They would do anything for me. So Amir Sahib said, oh, this guy is deluded. Bishak, your wife and kids love you and you love them back. But at the end of the day, it's going to be every man for himself when we drop dead. So he said, Amir Sahib said to him, he said, listen. When you uh, st spend the day with us today and then Isha Salat, after Isha Salat, go home. But before you go home, come and meet me. So he spent the whole day with them. He sat in the Amals and then after Isha Salat, he said, Amir Sahib, I'm going. So Amir Sahib pulled out something sharp, you know, he had like a key or something. In his pocket. He said, right, okay, I'm going to puncture you with this. Not puncture you, but I'm going to press it down twice on your arm. So you get two red marks. He said, Amir Sahib, what are you doing? Are you crazy? He said, look, believe me. Trust me. He said, now, with this, quickly go home with these two mar red marks, put your sleeve down, get into bed, right, when the lights are off and everything, all of a sudden start screaming. Yeah, when, the, when your wife wakes up and if you say, oh, I've been bitten, I've been bitten by a snake. I'm dying, I'm dying. And when they all start panicking, say that there's a Jamaat in the masjid and there's a guy in that masjid who's a special, uh, specialist on snake poison. He knows how to extract snake poison. So there, somebody will come to the masjid, we'll do the rest of it. You just keep screaming. He said, okay. So according to plan, they did that and he went home, he got into bed with his wife and then all of a, after a few minutes, ah! And they turn on the lights, what's happened? He's crying, oh, I'm bitten, bitten, bitten. He said, oh, get the doctor, no, forget the doctor, there's a guy in the machine. So they went running and the Jamaat was already waiting, uh, for, according to the plan. The Amir Sahib came running and he looked and the wife is screaming and the children are screaming and the brothers and his dad and everyone have come as well. He said, what's happened, what's happened? And everyone's climbing onto the bed, snake, he's been bitten by a snake, where's the snake, where's the snake? So they're looking and the Amir Sahib said, you're a, you're a specialist, come here, come here, come here. Look, what's happened? So he looks at it, he said, oh, I can recognize this, a snake from just the bite. He said, look, look, look. He said, oh, man. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. He said, what's happened? He said, he's been bitten by a snake. He said, yeah, we know that, but why are you saying inna lillahi? He said, you know, the snake that he's been bitten by is a deadly snake. Deadly snake. He said, well, what does that mean? He said, he's going to die. No, 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 you got to save him, you got to save him. No, he's going to die. No, no, you got to save him. He said, there must be somewhere. His wife now is tugging out uh, the Amir Sahib's garment as well. Please, please, everyone's begging. You got to save him, you got to save him, you got to do something. He said, no, there's no way. Go on, you must have some medicine. He said, there's no way. There must be somewhere. He said, actually, there is one way. He said, go on then, do it quickly. He said, no, but I'm not doing it. He said, what is it? He said, there's, the only way to save this person who's been bitten by the snake is if you suck out that poison, the person's life will be saved. He said, do it then. He said, I'm not doing it. He said, there's a catch. He said, what's that? He said, whoever sucks out the poison dies. <laughs> so now everyone's stepping back. So he said, so you do it on yourself. He said, look, I don't know the guy. I'm just in Jamaat. I've just come for one day. I don't know the guy. I'm not related to him. I'm not going to do it. He says to the wife, he said, you do it. He says to the son, you do it. Now everyone's arguing with this. Shit. No, you do it. You do it. You do it. You do it. Nobody's willing to suck out the poison because they know they're going to die in place of him. So then this guy is watching all this and he said, Amisa was correct. Uh, everyone loves me, but nobody's going to take a jump for me. So then he sits up and he says, there's nothing wrong with me. Amisa, I'm coming with you for four months. <laughs> so brothers, this is the reality of life. So inshallah, in this ishtima, many talks will be taking place. Inshallah, after Asr Salat, the long talk will take place. We should say, we should get others to say. And then when it's the shkil time to go out and make intentions to go out in the path of Allah, all of us, inshallah, make intentions to go out in the path of Allah. Everybody will make intention, inshallah. Yeah. Allah Ta'ala gives all the talking. Subhanallah.